Uh, I've been working on a collection of short stories. Um, and all of, them, all of them take place in rural areas. So mostly in Appalachia, um, in small towns. So like coal mining, um, coal mining towns that are now being fracked. Um, so it's kind of like one resource and then the next. And, and right now there aren't a lot of jobs because the coal mining industry is on its way out. Um, the fracking industry is still mostly booming, but um, they're just bringing people in from other states, so the actual community is, is just kind of being um, stripped in some ways. And so I'm really interested in um, how communities function and how people within the community, especially vulnerable people, are functioning while having this backdrop of like everything's kind of being sucked away. And um, so it's really that's the backdrop, and then these people are having relationships just like anybody, like whether it's families or... Um, other significant relationships happened in my community I grew up in, and my parents were offered the opportunity to allow, um, you know, I think it's Exxon Mobil to come in and to frack on one of the hillsides. Um, they usually go to the top, is the, the highest point, the top is point. Um, they usually go to the highest point, and uh, and they just drill down, and there's a tower with the lights. But um, you know, my parents declined, and so they just went to the next person mm -hmm. over. And they're still they're still sucking everything out. It's just that you know, doing the right thing doesn't mean that your land's not going to be affected as well. Right. So that's been kind of hard to see, and I'm interested in not just where I grew up, but the other communities around that, and how how people are living and relating and surviving. I think everyone's resigned to this is just the way it is now. And again, it's been like. And I can only speak for, you know, my small community I grew up in, like, a lot of people see it as a good thing. It's some income, even if it's a small amount, it's, you know, or like, you see, like, like the roads are collapsing in certain areas because the water trucks to, to bring, you know, to pump into the ground are just traveling nonstop. And, um, but it does seem like there's progress, like progress towards what, you know, like we are obtaining something, it is a fossil fuel, but um, it's not going back into the community and it is causing a lot of environmental impact like um, There are areas where between the mining and the fracking like the groundwater is destroyed um, Like certain reservoirs or freshwater lakes with fish um, Are damaged and the fish are dying and things like that. So there's it can be seen as a positive thing, but I See a lot of negatives. Bigo's home is full of machinery the engine of a John Deere, a 1985 carburetor, a smoky print press he's begun using as a kitchen table. Sawhorses are dressed like him, leather jackets, a welding mask, canvas gloves worn raw. We perch on the trembling sofa and I tell Vigo about my mother's illness, the chemo, the way she's begun treating everything like a traffic jam, a mass shooting, and he sighs. My mother died when I was 12, he says, there is never enough time. And I joke that I have been studying physics, have devised a plan to lengthen time. That I will take my mother to the edge of a black hole, where time is slower, bent by gravity, where light can be extended, and he smiles. If you are at the edge of a black hole, you would look out and see the Earth and all of its events passing by rapidly, but you couldn't do anything about it. It's still passing, but you have only slowed yourself down relative to the Earth and everyone you know and love on Earth would be dead in five minutes, 10 minutes your time. When you return, the Earth would have aged hundreds, thousands of years without you. He pets my head like a tiny mollusk, kisses each finger, so what now, he says, what will you do with this extra time? We make love quickly, heatedly. He presses me down on the bed, says, I want to worship this body. Afterwards, I ask, what are the others like? Do you want to worship their bodies too? And he softly replies, don't do this. What we have is special, Anna. He kisses my stomach, my hip says nothing about the hair I am growing like a slash and burn recovery mission. I am a forester, I am a Lorax. Beside his house there is a carp pond, a creek with snapping turtles, a field full of thistle, but the thing I like most are the speckled goldfish that live in the old clawfoot bathtub out back that just exist back and forth waiting. On the worst days, my mother has what the home nurse calls a severe depletion of electrolytes and fluids, and she is hooked up to a home IV like a laptop without a battery. The dreaded blue screen of death, my father jokes, but he looks sad, older, 
There are deep purple patterns beneath his eyes. On my mother's dresser, piled magazines, books on abused children, domestic violence. She taps my knee, tells me that the anorexics grow fur when they begin to starve to death, that the bearded women at freak shows have hirsutism, an excess of androgen hormones, a genetic flaw. Do you want to be like them, she says. Do you want people to think you're sick? She leaves a trail of her own hair through the house like a molting tree, a child throwing rice at a wedding gone wrong. There are t-shirts in the shower, toast in the toilet. Everything is rehomed, remodeled, shucked. When the TV newscasters announce a solar eclipse, the first in 15 years in Pennsylvania, my mother turns it off, then on again, goes into the kitchen to make tea. Everything eventually becomes a repetition of something else, she says. Later, she shows me the obituary section of the Observer Reporter, a man she dated in high school. Marty Benson walked into the auditorium and sat down at the grand piano, she says. And when he began to play, I knew that I loved him. A man who makes music like that has a gentle soul. She smooths the fuzzy tablecloth, picks at a dried spot of food. I would have been a widow at 50, she says, closing the paper. Can you imagine that? The TV chatters like a back-burning cookery. Somewhere, the bloated snoring of my father like the ocean waves crashing. She looks up at me with headlights for eyes, like a gosling that's imprinted onto a moon. Says love like that washes ashore once in a lifetime. And you either gather and protect, or you let it wash right back into the ocean. When I visit Vigo to help him to install a water heater, what he calls a two-man gig, he tells me about a Sicilian woman that he met at the machine shop who had both breasts cut off because she carried the BRCA gene. She is curt and firm and fierce, he says. She has beautiful fake titties now. I watch his dark hair move like submerged an enemy, drowned fields. You should tell that to my mother, I say. I imagine this woman with Vigo perched naked on the same sofa we're sitting on, using his toilet, perfuming his bed. Today, there is a pile of plastic pipes in the center of his bedroom, bolts and nuts on dinner plates in the kitchen. My mother had cancer, Vigo says. They did not find out until it was too late. You are lucky, he says. You will have more time to say goodbye. And I straighten out, say, what makes you think I have to say goodbye? He sweet talks me off the ledge, calls me his canary, his orchid, but he might as well call me his mop, his wash rag. I bury myself in the sheets, wring myself out. His hand traces my jaw, closes around my throat, and I feel my head rushing, tingling, swarming as he kisses me. When he finally lets go, the world rushes back in vivid, molten color. Did you like that, he says. Some women like this. We sleep, but sometime in the night, Vigo rolls away from me to the edge of the bed, the universe, and he is dangling like a fishing rod, like a broken spoke. I am too afraid to touch him. His spine is a cobblestone pathway in the moonlight, the moon, kept in orbit around the earth because it rolls along the path that the earth's mass creates by way of gravity, like a subway system. And all the moon really wants to do is to move in a straight line, but the path it must take is curved, warped, distorted, futile, each night, the moon ends up, despite its best efforts, in the same exact spot. That for a long time, I focused on poetry. Um, got my MFA in poetry. But um, at a certain point, I really wanted to tell, like, poetry can do so much, but I really wanted to tell a, a certain story that I couldn't do with my poetry. I tried and tried and tried, and I really started to explore fiction. There are long poems and poems that can do a lot. I don't write narrative poetry. Um, my poetry is mostly, like, it's pretty lyric-centric. Um, and I think that there is a, a long and complicated story that I first wanted to, to, to try and write about. And um, I had all of these ideas and I just, yeah, it, it worked differently for me for that. Um, and I really, I really love both. And um, I'll go into one mode and I'll be writing fiction and I kind of have to switch off and go into another mode. Um, to write poetry and go back and forth.